Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to Blockchain Research Abstracts Session 2. We are very honored uh, today to have with us Professor Sandeep Shukla, who is the chair of uh, this session. And Sandeep is also a senior editor of our journal, the JBBA, also an advisor to the Center for Evidence-Based Blockchain, and also National Blockchain Project lead uh, uh, in India for his institution. He is going to tell uh, you a little bit more about him and the work he is doing. So thank you very much, Sandeep. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am very honored to be part of this conference. I have been so for the last two years. And thankfully, uh, we don't have to travel, uh, uh, which is very nice. <laughs> but uh, and that is not to say that traveling to London is not lucrative. Uh, uh, but uh, right now we are uh, doing okay. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, about me, I am actually a professor of computer science and engineering uh, at IIT Kanpur, which is an Indian Institute of Technology in, in the city of Kanpur. And uh, my, my main job is in cybersecurity. So I am actually a program director for a technology innovation hub in cybersecurity. But we also have a very large project from the Prime Minister's Office of Government of India. Uh, it's the National Blockchain Project. And our charter is to actually develop e-governance solutions to, uh, uh, you know, in blockchain and use that in, real, in, in the real governance problems. And in that context, uh, so this project started three years ago. And in that context, uh, we have already developed a land record registry uh, system uh, which uh, is now being used in the in the state of Karnataka uh, in six districts out of 70 districts six districts it has been rolled out and it is being rolled out as we speak to other districts uh, India has a large population so it's uh, it has to be quite scalable and quite robust uh, we also completed an e-procurement uh, solution for the same government, the government of Karnataka uh, uh, and uh, on blockchain. And currently we are also working on uh, a, another procurement solution, um, basically kind of a um, uh, tracking, tracking of the entire process of procurement in the city of Lucknow, which is in the state of Uttar Pradesh, where, uh, uh, you know, it is also a blockchain based project. Another project that has gotten quite a bit of attention, even from the Prime Minister, is the uh, self-sovereign identity blockchain that we have developed. And IIT Kanpur was the first uh, institute in the last uh, December, uh, where the Prime Minister came to uh, inaugurate uh, providing degrees as self-sovereign identity documents, or what we call the verifiable credential-based uh, degrees. Uh, so with one click, he could, he could actually give the degrees to uh, 1,723 students. And uh, apparently that impressed him. And when, when, when he went back, there was another special award given to children. Uh, and he told the Ministry of uh, uh, Children and uh, Youth Welfare that uh, this uh, uh, award needs to be given on a blockchain like we did saw in IIT Kanpur. So we did that. And now we are trying to uh, get this uh, idea of self-sovereign identity and verifiable credentials, uh, uh, zero knowledge proof based uh, identity documentation on which are actually held by the customers uh, or held by the users on their digital wallet. And there is no centralized repository of these documents. And it can be verified almost instantly through cryptographic uh, means. That is uh, actually one of our uh, very successful projects that we just, uh, you know, uh, we, we worked on for last two years. And on the other side, we are also doing a lot of work on cryptocurrency forensics to find uh, malicious activities in, in Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. And we have, we have, we are now currently building a tool uh, very similar to chain analysis to actually help the Indian law enforcement to actually uh, find uh, the uh, various crypto crimes. So that's that's all about me and my relation with blockchain. So we can start. 
the uh, um, actual speakers of the session. And I think I, th I, I saw the first speaker uh, just uh, before we started, right? That's right. So first speaker is Sapide. Sapide, you can start now. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. As you have, my name is Sapide Mullah Jafari. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I will talk about my piece of work, uh, which I have I've done it on blockchain. Let me just share my slide here. Uh, could you please confirm that you can see the slide? Yes. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Thank you. So uh, in the next 10 minutes, I will talk about uh, a piece of work I have carried out in the title of overview of blockchain technology and security risk, a seven layer perspective. The purpose of my work is to conduct a systematic investigation into different type of vulnerability inherent to a smart contract to describe the interrelationship between vulnerabilities, attack, and the related consequences in the case of Ethereum smart contract to devise a detailed taxonomy that enhances the security of transaction of Ethereum blockchain. As you see, uh, this figure shows the research roadmap where the, the secondary data collected from academic papers such as ACM, Direct, and Valid website and some of the books. The focus was on blockchain technology, layering, platform, smart contract, features, vulnerability, and attack. Based on the finding from the literature review, I created blockchain architecture, seven layer architecture. And after that, with analyzing the security issue, I created a table which introduced uh, some of the security vulnerability and threats, and finally created taxonomy to focus on most vulnerable layer of blockchain. And based on all the findings, I'm developing a smart contract with using the solidity language, using some of the uh, security tools to evaluate the smart contract, deploy it on Ethereum virtual machine, and finally have a secure transaction between smart contract and the wallet. In this slide, as you see, it's a seven layer blockchain system architecture. Most researchers describe the architecture as six layer model comprising a data layer, network layer, consensus layer, incentive layer, contract layer, and application layer. Huang and his colleagues, on the other hand, use a seven layer architecture. They are adding the physical layer to the six layer model. And others like Homoliak, Chen, and their colleagues condensed the architecture into the four-layer model. But I believe using low granularity level poses a high risk of missing the source and therefore understanding the nature of the security threats. So I adopted more detailed architecture compromising several layers, which includes physical layer, data, network, consensus, incentive, contract, and application, and I listed all features for each layer of blockchain. So this uh, uh, table, which uh, attacks and vulnerability of uh, vulnerability of security issue with a smart contract covers important security attacks and relevant vulnerabilities of a smart contract implemented on Ethereum blockchain, Ethereum platform, which includes three columns. The first column includes some of the vulnerabilities and attack, and the second uh, column shows some of the attacks here because some of these are vulnerability and attacks cause different attacks as well. And finally, in the last column, uh, I highlighted the relevant and related consequences for each vulnerability and attacks. So based on the finding from the table of attacks and vulnerability, I found that the contract layer is arguably, arguably is the most vulnerable layer in blockchain architecture. A smart contract enhanced trust in blockchain technology, paradoxically, smart contracts are prone to security vulnerability due to high dependence on programmers and exposure to bugs. 
The key point is that once you deploy a smart contract in blockchain, you cannot modify or alter it. It makes some advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that it represents a trustworthy platform where the developer cannot modify the smart contract after deploying on blockchain. But in contrast, if the developer did not test the code and if there is a bug that didn't detect, it uh, before deploying, it will cause major security issues. It's not surprising that a great deal of research is dedicated to security issue associated with a smart contract. Homoliak and his colleagues, for example, they used a four layer architecture to devise a taxonomy of vulnerability, threats and defenses in friends to a smart contract platform. The coarse granularity of the blockchain architecture, however, makes the taxonomy rather generic and lacking details. The Stefani and his colleagues advocate strengthening smart contract security by using accepted based practices in traditional software engineering. Samrin and Alafi presented a good description of the vulnerability based on the National Institution of Standard and Technology Board framework. And other researchers such as Shahda focus on their work on a specific attack on vulnerability within a smart contract. So, as well as listing the security issue and content media, I propose taxonomy that offer best practices to adopt when developing a smart contract. This taxonomy includes some of the Ethereum and Solidity vulnerability, best practices when we are writing a Solidity and uh, when we are writing a smart contract with using Solidity language, and also best practice to be adopted for developer because smart contract is still new and new bug and security risks are constantly being discovered. Developers should be aware of this security issue and follow some of the quality assurance tests during the developing smart contract. And also, I introduced some of the static and dynamic security analysis tool, which uh, help to analyze and detect vulnerable contract when we can use it before deploying smart contract on Ethereum blockchain and after deploying exactly like when hackers uh, try to find a vulnerable smart contract on the internet. And then uh, in the conclusion of future world, I provided an overview of smart threat vulnerability associated with each of seven layer of blockchain paid particular attention to the security issue associated with smart contract when developing using Solidity within an Ethereum platform, develop a smart contract taxonomy, the distinct the vulnerability and some of the best practices to counter them. And finally, is that for the future, it's a greater focus to be placed on vulnerability on the contract layer, which have a high impact on the blockchain network and develop a smart contract to enhance the security to cut a security issue. At the moment, I'm developing a smart contract. I try to uh, focus on the main security issue exists in contract layer using some of the valid websites, some of the valid tools to write a secure smart contract and deploy it on Ethereum blockchain. Thank you for listening and I'm ready to answer your question. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for your very, very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I have one question. So if you go to the industry and speak to people who are developing blockchain-based applications, they talk about layer one blockchain, and then they talk about the uh, contract, contract layer, and then they talk about the application layer. And the layer one is basically where you have the nodes and you have the... Uh, protocols p2p communication protocols and then which they, layer the layer one the layer one application no no the layer one physical block. layer so, no so the people look at people look at the blockchain in the industry as layer one blockchain and then sub uh, the contracts on top of that and then applications on top of that right so uh, so what i'm trying to say is that there may be another lay another level you know if you think about your seven layer you may want to have another set of three layers 
the certain things are belongs to the layer one blockchain that is that is nodes and their connection their p2p communication and that uh, you know broadcast transaction uh, uh, broadcast and possibly the validation of uh, by each node the transactions and then uh, for example layer one is very much exactly what the bitcoin blockchain does and then the blockchain uh, layer uh, the second uh, on, on top of that you may actually overlay smart contract capability so that's where the where the contract layer comes and after the contract uh, if after you have smart contract capabilities your ability to create applications is endless because you have a turing turing program uh, complete language so in that sense i can look at this blockchain a a, a a modern blockchain application in three layers layer one blockchain layer two uh, in the contract layer and layer three is the application layer so your other five layers now belong to the layer one uh, of the layer one like physical layer networking layer uh, those layers will now become uh, consensus layer they, uh, they will become part of the first uh, uh, layer one blockchain every layer one blockchain will have these so you can overlay another layering like seven layer but seven layer can be divided into this uh, uh, you know this this uh, four layers or five layers belong to layer one second is uh, the contract layer and third is your uh, the your application layer you can you, you can show that on top of your seven layer layering that's a great idea. I didn't think about it. That's a great idea. We'll definitely will will work on it. Yes, thank you. Very useful. Thank you. Okay, so I think uh, thank you very much again, uh, and we'll move to the next speaker. Thank you for listening. Thank you. So uh, the next speaker is uh, Betretin uh, Gurkan. So please go ahead. Hello, have a good day. Can you hear me and see me well? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I am sharing my screen as well. Uh, just a minute. So can you hear me my slide now? Yes. Perfect. So let me set my time to 10 minutes to don't pass it. Now we can start. Mm -hmm. So hello everyone, it is Adorni Bedetin Gurkan. Uh, first, thanks so much for this great event. Uh, I'm honored to join this event third time. And it was very nice to join the first event right before the COVID in Edinburgh. And now, of course, the last second or last two ones are online, but I hope the fourth one will be the physically and then we will have a chance to meet one by one uh, with everybody. So uh, let me introduce myself very quick. Uh, I'm a better Gurkan. I'm an international lawyer. Uh, I have a license in two countries, and uh, but also I'm the partner of um, international law firm Gurkan Partners and founder of the Blockchain Law Lab. And since 2016, I'm working on the uh, academic side of the cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And about the last four years, I'm a researcher at University of Seget. Uh, on the PhD level, I hope that next uh, year I will join this event as a doctor. I hope so. So first, uh, today topic is the legal frame of the uh, NFTs. Uh, probably many of you already heard it, non-fungible tokens, and then opportunities of various implementations of these NFTs. So uh, how we can proceed this uh, presentation? First, of course, I will uh, try to explain basics of the NFTs and blockchain, but I don't spend so much time on the blockchain, the main pro promises since we already know, I guess, many of us. And the second one is the legal frame of the NFTs. I'm trying to give kind of summary information to don't board everyone uh, about uh, about to legal frame, which kind of legal problems might be, uh, appear. And the other uh, third step is the NFT use cases and the final talks of the NFTs. So the, technically, uh, the first blockchain three premises, uh, which are the, uh, as you know, the blockchain in general it is transparent as long as we talk about the public blockchains. And it is a decentralized. Uh, also, we can say that it is also discussable how decentralized it is. As you know, there are different blockchains. Uh, but it is a kind of main concept of the blockchain. And the most important one is immutable. It is uh, uh, fungible, we can say. So uh, with um, NFT and blockchain, and technically the first NFT promises original authentic digital contacts. 
and it has been secure by design, unfungible and immutable system, instant and transparent mainly in many projects. So what is the NFT, non-fungible token, which is a very famous word, but sometimes it is missing what is the meaning. So technically NFTs are the digital assets that are built on the blockchain. And technically, uh, recent years, the NFT popularity, especially with COVID, increased very much. And technically, NFTs might represent the work of music, art, image, intent creation, transaction, and even some uh, digital land we will discuss following up this uh, presentation. Uh, also, NFTs provide evidence of ownership of virtual or sometimes physical assets. It's a kind of all about to uh, pro, uh, prove of uh, ownership, either the data or originality. So also, uh, yeah, I will try to summarize like a very types of the blockchain, which is very important, I guess. Uh, the thing that, as you know, the blockchain has been divided into public and uh, private blockchains, and most of these NFT projects has been uh, has been improved on the Ethereum uh, E20 or other uh, layer uh, blockchains. And mostly it is a permissionless, but sometimes permissioned as well. And then technically Ethereum is like a public permissionless blockchain or Bitcoin. But there are also the other uh, examples of the different uh, side. Also, there are different uh, models, but three of them are the most important ones, like a proof of work, which is a Ethereum and Bitcoin, so uh, Bitcoin mainly, and proof of stake, uh, which is a, another field. And proof of history, which is another technology development. I won't give so much details about that, but it's the kind of very main working models of blockchain. So, legal framework of the NFTs. Uh, actually, it is kind of confusing that in the legal side, uh, because in the cryptocurrency, we already discussed about the legal frame of the cryptocurrencies, security, money, or goods, and other part. But in technically, NFTs are a bit more complicated somehow, because NFT may represent many different things. And it's the reason that. Uh, deciding on the legal frame is very important. So the technically first we need to, there is no existing uh, very clear NFT regulation yet in across the world in many countries. Uh, but first, uh, the main thing is the IP law, which is intellectual property, because most it represents the artwork. Uh, but also there will be some other uh, regulations might be implemented. So legal challenges of these NFTs are uh, intellectual property rights, security regulations, MLA regulations, uh, royalties, uh, data protection, GDPR, and taxation aspects. Uh, I will try to summarize very quick. Uh, the first is that intellectual property rights. Uh, NFTs can display work of digital content and technical owner details and timestamp, and, and then, but it might represent more uh, thing. But uh, for example, if you buy the NFT of one like a drawing, let's say, or design, okay, it might prove it might may be proved proof of the ownership since you are the owner of this NFT, but it doesn't mean that you are the owner of the license. Let me give you the example. NBA uh, has been released uh, LeBron James uh, NFTs. However, uh, copyrights of this, uh, let's say, uh, artwork has been still owned by the NBA. Uh, NFT doesn't mean that you also get the intellectual property or license right of the artwork. Uh, and second thing is the security regulations and uh, technically sometimes some NFT projects since they can issue also tokens and uh, these tokens can give you some other rights as a um, second market for example uh, technically you can send one buy one artwork and then sell it to second work but technically you can keep by uh, only or keep making money through this way and then sometimes this might be uh, regulated as security, which is a kind of dangerous thing on the legal part because it is it has been regulated in many, many countries very very strict. And but also in other side, there is a decentralized finance and DeFi, decentralized exchanges. Uh, these are also like a totally out of the order that which kind of legal legal side we need to put these um, big developments. Actually, it's a big discussion. Anti-money laundering law, uh, which is actually in recent years we hear a lot. And, and uh, technically, fract fractional NFTs, as we, dis we discussed previously, uh, kind of may provide liquidity and trading, utilizing rep fungible token to represent the fra uh, fractionalization of NFTs. And technically, it may classify it as security. And because of that, also, it will be the underwriter of the anti money laundering. But even actual on artwork, if, you, if it represents some art, and technically, in US, for example, uh, in some artworks also has been the under the radar of the anti-money laundering regulations since so many money laundering is going on also on artworks. 
uh, we can say. And the fourth one is the royalties. So technically, the artists especially can keep make money through their work, even the second, third, fourth, fifth uh, sale of this NFT, since it is a traceable and transparent. And and then also that it may be the comment of the royalty. And the royalties has been regulated in different countries, different land. I mean, to check that where they especially this uh, writer is from or where the um, art has been produced. Data protection is another field. Technically, every artist or NFT holders somehow may put their own private data on these NFTs. And then technically, after second, third, fourth trade, they may lose this control. And then it might be a violation of some uh, data protection uh, principles. Taxation aspect, which is another field. And uh, first, value the tax, since it is not a cryptocurrency, but uh, sometimes it's a kind of art. It must be discussed about the value the tax and also capital profit tax, which is already has been certain that if you make money, like you make a profit to buy and sell, then you need to mostly declare this tax. And marketplaces, and you know that's uh, like a mostly the are uh, be, be, besides OpenSea, Reliable Foundation, Super Rare, NBA, and there are different um, NFT models, and even actually there are some different models. And I will try to give like a last one minute uh, to two examples. Fly Fish Club, uh, it is a kind of first dining club, like a kind of restaurant, uh, which provides you the private dining room in New York. And the, technically, these NFTs kind of represent some membership rights and of, of some um other advantages and uh, technically it is interesting and it is a uh, their price list for example as you see and second one is the metaverse actually i would like to edit metaverse as well on my uh, presentation because it's a very top field decentraland for example it is another do decentral autonomous organization uh, project technically it has been controlled by the users and it's a virtual world you can buy sell technically everything, many things like a characters, like a uh, lens and many things. And uh, there are also some other problems might be hit where copyright law, tax law, criminal competition, security side. For example, in case of you create a brand and put on the NFT, and then if they replicate your brand, then what will happen? Uh, this kind of question will be a uh, question. So conclusion, and technically now NFT markets has passed over 41 billion uh, dollar in 2021, I mean, previous year, and then it is almost past, uh, almost catching the global fine art market. So the technically, uh, the block it is very good for blockchain ecosystem, but in other side, either for customer protection or uh, to avoid any legal sanction, uh, the, um, the project should be careful about the legal obligations of this project, since that it must be uh, comment uh, very differently. So I am finishing my presentation with the Steve Jobs uh, quota. Let's go even more though, instead of worrying about what happened yesterday. So the technically, I guess, what the blockchain is doing now, every time when there is a something mistake or uh, some uh, bad things happen in the previous time, but it is improving the system and I hope that it will be much more better in the following years. So thanks so much and I would love to hear your questions and please keep in touch in case of any question here or anytime. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, interesting, uh, you know, perspective on the legalities, uh, legal issues in uh, NFT. I have a question. Uh, so suppose you said that in uh, in the NFL uh, situation, the LeBron James uh, pictures, uh, the copyright is held by NFL. So if I purchase the NFT, uh, I I, what? Why? How, why would somebody else buy it from me? I mean, I, I cannot give them the copyright or anything. So, what is the point uh, of uh, this NFT? Yeah, actually, you are totally right. It's like a, technically you are buying the NF NBA shirt, let's say, or the yeah. shirt, right? And yeah. technically you are buying the shirt, right? But uh, when there is a logo of NBA, but they yeah. don't sell you the using of this logo on your, let's say, cap because they are holding the copyright law, uh, right. copyright right. And then technically it is a confusing, especially in many um, open platform like OpenSea, they are selling the artwork and then this artwork might be the very famous, like the banana on the art, maybe you remember. Uh, but you can buy this, um, let's say, uh, artwork and then you can use it, no problem. But let's say that you're going to give the licenses of using this artwork as a printing on the t-shirt. And then this company may sue you that because on your contract you need to check that whether you're getting license or not. And technically, many, many of them doesn't sell you the license. 
And actually, it's a very smart idea because first, they make good money to selling the artwork to you, right? And maybe overpriced. And secondly, if the artwork become very famous, and then, of course, you would like to make more money to give license. And then that moment, they catch you and they say that, sorry, we sold you this T-shirt, but not the uh, license. And then also they make another more money by means of this artwork. It's a kind of, uh, actually, it's a total IP, IP law uh, field. Uh, everyone should be very careful what they are buying. I mean, not just license or just logo or just maybe limited time of using those. It might be happen. Like they can give you the using five years. After five years, they can take it over from you. Okay. Thank you so much. So You're very welcome. I think we have time for only one question. So we move to the third speaker. Trevor. Hello, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, we can hear you, yes. Yeah, sorry, I'll just share my screen and video now. Uh, can you see my slide decks? Not yet. Can you see my slide decks? Yeah, now yes. Okay. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll just do my camera. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Uh, Trevor Classy, and today I'll be presenting on the following presentation, um, Developing Educational Awareness of Blockchain, a student-led blockchain DLT research fellowship. And it's, this is basically, we go through the processes of how we recruited a student and how we got them to um, research a project um, which looked at public sector developments um, of blockchain and distributed ledger technology um, innovations across Europe. And um, it's a core project with Block W. Block W are um, a Irish-based group who uh, promote inclusivity um, for blockchain, not only blockchain technologies, but also for um, the technology stacks, so artificial intelligence, um, IoT, and other really innovative technologies. Um, just moving on to uh, my second slide. So in terms of the research team, um, the student in question who carried out the research um, was Mr. Dominic Allen, and um, he was a student of GMIT at the time. Um, he was involved in various um, student groups, and student bodies, which looked at new in innovation technologies and also at cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies. Um, at the time, uh, Dominic was a fourth year student when he applied for our research fellowship to study this particular project. Um, so it was really even engaging Dominic during his interview was for the position, it was really an interesting process because he had such a fundamental knowledge of blockchain, distributed technologies and cryptocurrencies, but he also wanted to kind of develop an enhanced awareness of, you know, where Europe was in terms of blockchain developments, particularly not only in the private sector, but in the public sector. Um, in terms of the two research mentors, there was myself, uh, my name is Dr. Trevor Classy. And I've been researching blockchain technologies, I suppose, for the last seven to eight years. I first came into contact with blockchain technology all the way back in 2014. Um, my supervisor at the time, um, when I was entering into my postdoctorate, gave me a kind of carte blanche to kind of develop a research strategy around any area uh, in particular I, that I wanted to. And um, at the time, I had an entrepreneur um, podcast, and I met this really you know, really up and coming entrepreneur who was going into the world of cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And he advised me to get into the word block, into the blockchain. And, you know, it's actually concrete. That is my research facet over the next couple of years as part of my um, my doctoral. And it was interesting when I pitched it to my supervisor, He's he was kind of astonished because he hadn't heard of blockchain technologies, hadn't heard of cryptocurrencies. And he actually, he said, you know, I could be taking a chance here by you know, orientation, my postdoctoral uh, uh, research strategy all around blockchain, but it, it's worked out pretty well. Over the last couple of years, I've um, promoted and educated block tech about, about everything in terms of blockchain technologies, not only in academia, 
but also with small, medium and large enterprises. It's interesting that since 2017, educational awareness of blockchain technologies has grown exponentially, but there's a lot more to do because as, as yourselves, as board members and um, attendees know, that blockchain is not this you know black box technology. It's morphed into various um, developments over the last few years. So for example, I would be you know, working with a company to teach new employees about um, proof of work, um, proof of stake, um, staking protocols, nodes, DeFi's, and just as your previous speaker um, alluded to, NFTs. You know, it, 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 it really is interesting to see where all these developments are going with blockchain technologies. And I suppose I was very lucky to have collaborated with Professor Joyce O'Connor um, over the last couple of years in terms of looking into how we can enhance educational awareness of blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. Um, I was on the board as, of the Blockchain Ireland Education, Innovation and Skills Group as secretary, Joyce's chair. Um, and, you know, over the past year, we've worked on how, you know, looking at European context, looking at the skills needed, looking at various studies by the Chase Group, um, by the ESRI and various other reports by the European um, um, Blockchain Observatory, just to see the context in terms of what is going on in Europe. And it's very interesting today, you know, um, the EU are going to review a regulatory framework for cryptocurrencies. You know, a European Parliamentary a Committee will vote on a new regu regulatory framework for crypto assets. Uh, which could accelerate passage of a measure that industry executives are saying could practically, you know, ban key digital currencies, including Bitcoin and Ethereum in Europe, because they're based on a proof of work system, which has high in, high um, energy intensive demands. Um, so that's a really interesting, you know, um, development today that coincides with this presentation. But I suppose the research team of myself and Joyce we worked with Dominic and we'll, um, over the summer um, of last year to kind of look at the European context of where you know blockchain and DLT technologies were in Europe. And just moving on, you know, and that collaboration to, you know, why is Europe important? You know, um, you know, if you look at all the reports, Europe's ambition is to be or set the gold standard for blockchain technologies. Um, they're kind of on the road to implementing a strong and regulatory policy framework that kind of supports sustainable blockchain innovation, as well as the startup and scale up, or, or sorry, scale up systems. And, you know, when you look at the kind of role that blockchain, why is it important? You know, if I, if I could bullet point it, I could spend here all day talking about why it's so important for Europe. But it, number one, it's revolutionizing how we share data. You know, by creating trust in data in ways that were not possible before, blockchain has the potential to kind of revolutionize how we can carry, you know, out transactions online. So, for example, here in Ireland, and with the price of petrol, I was talking about, you know, electric cars and the move to electric cars. So, if you look at how we can revolutionize how we share data, you know, individuals owning electric cars and energy companies can trust one another to fairly remunerate the charging of, let's say, e-batteries with electricity with third parties when blockchains immutably record the provenance of the electricity and the status of an e-battery to and after charging. It's also transforming Europe's industries and course cross-border, you know, public services. It's also, it also has the potential to build a citizen-centric digital society. And, and finally, you know, why is it important to Europe? It's a contribution to the European economy. You know, as the blockchain industry grows in, in, in conjunction with all these other facets that I described earlier, earlier cryptocurrencies, NFTs and staking, it will contribute to the European economy, creating both jobs and value. And I suppose when I go to the next slide, you know, the research behind, you know, or, you know, recruiting Dominic as a student, you know, we, we, we began brainstorming the context of what we were going to look at. We found that the European um, you know, context in terms of public sector developments was very important. We put in a project proposal and we got funding through our internal uh, research office here. We did recruit Dominic as a student. I suppose June, July and August were really pivotal in terms of training Dominic and getting feedback 
and actually it was eye-opening for ourselves just to see Dominic's findings in terms of the progress in countries like Germany, you know, Britain, um, Denmark, Switzerland, Belarus, and so on, in terms of where they were at. And then in September, it was a quick turnaround, and the project was handed over. We looked at it, we evaluated. But, I, but you know, the problem with projects like this is that they're at a point in time, and blockchain technology is moving rapidly on. So it's, it, it, it gave us a good picture of where Europe was at, but, you know, blockchain technology is accelerating at an astonishing rate. And I suppose the framework we use, I know you have a bit of time here, but, you know, we, we looked at the literature to see what kind of framework and rating scale Dominic could use to kind of analyze each of the country's progress. And, you know, regulatory and legal frameworks formed the, 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 the kind of the foundation. You need to have regulatory frameworks and legal frameworks and legislation in place in order for a you know, public sector or a country to feel confident that they can start to roll out a technology. And we rated each of these as we go up from one to three. So one having zero um, type of regulatory or legal frameworks to three actually having a regulatory framework developed. We then moved on to national blockchain DLT strategy. So this is the vision of the country in terms of where they were sitting, in terms of where they positioned blockchain in amongst other technologies. We then looked at exemplar use cases. So either that being a, you know, a public and um, solely uh, funded use case or a, a kind of a public private kind of collaboration. And finally, at the top, we looked at blockchain and DLT courses that were available within that specific country. And I suppose, you know, some of the lessons that we learned as part of this project, you know, um, you know, advocating student-led research, it was an incredible value, uh, valuable, you know, um, project to work on with Dominic. He's gone on now to um, his master's in Trinity, where he'll be, you know, um, embedding aspects that he's learned here into his master's project. But if we look at here, how can we advance student-led blockchain DLT research. The research context is important. And what we hope to do next year is rather than Dominic doing that master's elsewhere is to capture that student and, let, and get them to do a master's here in university and hopefully to fulfill a further education and a PhD. We hope to also you know, offer a student an annual blockchain scholarship. And then we will recruit that student um, ambassador to work with us um, and finally, the far last couple of steps is to kind of, you know, create industry awareness on the projects that we're working on, develop cogent industry partnership, create research agendas, and hopefully next year we can come back again and present at the 22, 2022 um, blockchain conference and then reset and let's start again. Um, so that brings me up to um, the 10 minutes and I'd like to thank you for giving uh, me the opportunity um, to present here today. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, so, so you have taken a student from, uh, you know, the uh, last year of his uh, degree program, and then you actually uh, made him a blockchain. Uh, I don't know to whether to say expert, but at least at a at a at a condition that they can pursue for this further degree programs. Uh, on blockchain is that is that a good uh, summary of uh, what you presented or that, that's a great uh, uh, summary professor um, um, Shukla and um, what we hope to do is convert those graduate summer research internships which we you know we pitched it as a really innovative funding because a lot of time graduates will go out into industry and you it, you will fail to capture some of them who might have um, an interest in research and if they do have that research, get them to develop a master's proposal, get them to do a master's level degree, and hopefully continue that process. And we found it very fruitful, beneficial, and uh, it's interesting that he is taking parts of what he's learned, particularly with the research mentoring from Professor Joyce, who is vast experience myself um, on board. And um, we hope to make this an annual thing where we can actually create a blockchain center here and push out the research. And it's, it's, it's a bit like the tagline you use, empirical based or practice based research is so important. And given the, the students, the, the tools and arsenal to do that is very important for us as well, Professor. Thank you so much. I guess uh, 
we can now move on to the recorded presentation from Ukraine. That's right, yes. Unfortunately, Ukraine is currently at war and I do not have the opportunity to present personally the results of my research, so I've prepared my presentation in the form of a video. I have already spoken at British Blockchain Association conferences on the use of formal methods in the study of consensus algorithm, uh, detection and protection against cyber attacks, this is the third presentation I have devoted to the use of formal methods in tokenomics. Today the world is experiencing a boom in adoption of blockchain. New projects and services evolve daily, creating a new ecosystem of crypto-related platforms and products that use cryptocurrencies and tokens. Nevertheless, we are still in the very beginning of a blockchain ruled world, with only a few real benchmark or example of long-lasting self-sustaining token economies. The main reason is that the creation of a self-governing token economy is a difficult task that requires considerable effort, knowledge and provision. It is easy to see that most creators, even if they have a profound white paper and seem to have a thoughtful token economy, intuitively built pyramid-like structure with a lack of real token utility and stakeholders' motivation to hold. Most importantly, they use their tokens in daily activities within the platform. As a result, more projects never reach a system balance and become too dependent on the speculation of whale investors. One solution to this problem is to create tokenomics model and the use of formal methods. In particular, we use an algebraic approach for model creation, which uses a special algebra, algebra of behavior. This algebra is easy to understand and can be used for creation of tokenomic models. In particular, we have recently worked with a dozen tokenomics projects, the models of which were presented in the algebra of behavior. The purpose of this model is to verify the properties of tokenomics, especially such as economic equilibrium, centralization, rising token prices and keeping parameters within acceptable limits. In my presentation, I will illustrate the full chain of tokenomics model research using the Internet of Things project. The title of the project MASH Plus. At first glance, the scenarios that occur in tokenomics are like a game between participants who want to gain their own preferences. On the one hand, it is a sales game in which participants hold, sell or buy tokens according to changes in the token liquidity or marketing information. On the other hand, tokenomics is built according to some service which is built based on blockchain platforms. In many projects, the token is seen as a means of motivation deliberately created to increase its efficiency. Thus, in education system, the token is used to encourage students to study diligently to reduce the fee for educational services. In the other services, tokens are paid for reputation, number of services consumed, or installation of equipment. In general, the tokenomics of such services is built so that the more efficiently consumers use the service and are rewarded with tokens, the more profit goes to the creators of the service. The life cycle of the token, namely its sale, purchase and holding, is based solely on motivation. So the stronger the motivation, the better the tokenomics. On the other hand, even with a fairly good motivation, mistakes in the organization of interaction between stakeholders can lead to project failure. In general, tokenomics is the interaction between agents. This interaction is determined by the movement of tokens between them and the change in its value. 
Uh, each interaction is determined under what condition it is possible and how it changes the distribution of tokens. Establishing an algorithm for such interaction is the creation of a good self-governing tokenomics. Consider the example of Tokenomics Internet of Things service Mesh Plus. The essence of the project is to create a network of base points that provides data exchange with Internet of Things devices such as animal trackers, human health devices, car gadgets and other sensors and mobile gadgets. Such base points are antennas that provide a certain coverage for user. A token operates as a system for online payment and rewards. Accordingly, antenna owners receive rewards in tokens and users pay for traffic or bandwidth services in tokens. The token is used in the system to make a profit and appears in the investments. The first tasks the first task in creating tokenomics model is to identify agents and their interactions. The slide shows the main players in tokenomics in this project, investors, uh, team users, owners of antenna devices. They interact with the exchange, the Internet of Things platform and each other. There is a special agent, a set of speculators who pay, play on the course and liquidity of the token. For creation of tokenomics model, each agent interaction shall be presented in a formal way. I will not consider the exact semantics of formalism and the algebra of actions and behaviors. This will be described in an article of Journal of British Blockchain Association, which comes out in the next issue. I will only show the example of actions in a formal way, such as emissions of tokens, buying tokens by users on the exchange, selling tokens on the exchange, and other actions related to the redistribution of token between agents. Behavioral uh, equations determine the admissible sequence of uh, actions of uh, agents, for example, their cyclicity and alternatives. Uh, strictly speaking, the behavioral equations determine the kind of control flow of actions. This whole model can be created in a special software system that supports the algebra of behaviors. The control flow of actions can be represented in the form of a graph, which is automatically converted into algebraic equations. The sense of creating a model in the algebra of behavior is the further use of formal methods by which you can study the properties of tokenomics. What properties can be studied when we have a formal model? In addition to being able to perform modeling, both imitation and uh, algebraic, we can have evidence and proof that tokenomics reaches a certain equilibrium. We can determine whether the parameters of tokenomics, such as the price of the token, liquidity within the desired limits. One of the important properties of tokenomics is the study of phenomenon of centralization, when a large number of tokens are concentrated in the ownership of several agents. This property is also studied by algebraic modeling and other methods of automatic proof of properties. A property such as a significant leak of tokens on the stock exchange which causes a significant reduction in liquidity, can also be invest investigated. This is very important because we have examples of some projects that have failed despite the good white pages. All property can be represented in the form of, for in the form of formulas uh, in behavior algebra. Their examples are given on the slides. One of the problems with using formal methods and creating models is the fear of using mathematics. Also, creating a model is very close to uh, programming, just in this case the language is algebraic. 
On the other hand, many interactions between agents can be standardized and parameterized. We have created a kind of tokenomic constructor that allows you to create a tokenomic scenario using templates in plain natural language. Constructor is designed as a web application that is available to anyone who wants to create their own project. Unfortunately, we are delaying the launch of the application due to an invasion. It was developed jointly with the programmers of Kherson University, which is currently under occupation, but we hope that it will open in the next two or three months. In the tokenomics constructor, you can download your data about tokens and their price, investment, locking, emissions, as well as data about the service that this tokenomic supports, whether the Internet of Things or the Exchanger or the Education System. It is important to input the rewards and punishment of agents. Developments may also depend on factors that cannot be predicted – Bitcoin exchange rate, political events, failing stocks, and more. All this affects liquidity and therefore in modeling and research of tokenomics it is necessary to consider various scenarios of uh, fluctuations of token liquidity. Uh, the system allows to use different historical data or different variants of the influence of factors on liquidity and thus to test by the algebraic modeling the resistance of tokenomics to the influence of the external environment. All this can be selected when using the tokenomic constructor. We believe that such a constructor is a very important tool for creation tokenomics and will explore model for further use in practice. Thank you for attention. You can ask me questions in written form by email on the slide. Thank you, um, Professor Shukla. So obviously um, we cannot ask him question directly. So we can mark him on the on the basis of uh, the presentation. I have a question. And, uh, is this paper going to come in JBBA? Yeah, it's been published already. Oh, it is. Yeah, okay. it is published already. Um, we, I'll send you the link as well. Okay, thank you. So uh, if you could kindly, Professor Shukla, email us the scores. Yeah. Uh, and um, thank you very much, uh, everybody. I would like to thank uh, Professor Shukla for his time. Uh, joining all the way from India and all the speakers for excellent presentations. Um, <clears throat> we will see you um, again uh, next year. And uh, please do join us uh, at uh, four o'clock for the best abstracts award ceremony. Thank you. We, we have our next session now uh, with uh, uh, John Glenn uh, from HM Treasury. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. So, Brian, we end the session. Thank you. Yeah.